with his teeth he tears a piece from the hunk of bread in his right hand. In the same hand he holds a fork. He is able to manage the fork while maintaining his grip on the bread. Periodically he lowers the fork to his plate and brings some food to his mouth. He does this without ever releasing the camera from his gaze. He raises his right hand, the one with the fork and the hunk of bread, into the air. He is greeting the camera and summoning its gaze to him. A series of men walk between him and the camera, momentarily interrupting the attachment. The camera may lose sight of him momentarily, but his primacy in the scene is never lost. Like the sun behind the clouds, he is never forgotten. All the while he eats, his laden plate in his left hand, his empty tin cup dangling from a finger of this same hand, waiting until after the meal to be filled with black coffee. When he is threatened with eclipse, this man sidesteps a soldier, a cavalryman, a Red Cross medic, attentive to the lines connecting his gaze to that of the camera. It is as if there is a bridge suspended by cables from the camera's eye to his. The cables sway as he moves side to side. They appear to be severed momentarily as a soldier walks obliviously from the right foreground diagonally to the left side of the frame. But the threat posed by the soldier's oblivious back is anticipated by this unnamed man at the other side of the ocular bridge. He raises his right hand again, the one with the fork and the hunk of bread. He is mending the cables, threatened by the soldier's oblivious back. He is the embodiment of space, delineating the limits of the camera's gaze, its depth of field, its framing, its focus. He does this with a dramatic swagger, drawing the passive camera's attention with a wave of his right hand, the one with the fork and the hunk of bread. This man, whose name is not forthcoming, brings that same hunk of bread to his mouth and tears off a piece with his teeth, withdrawing the bread and tossing his right arm out to his side with an insouciant theatricality. Then the unthinkable happens. This man upon whom the camera's gaze is centered moves out of the frame to the left. The cables of the ocular bridge fall slack. Without him, we might expect a great gashing wound to overtake our field of vision. Without a unifying figure, the camera's gaze might disintegrate each element retreating to the solitude of its individuality, while the space between them, the fearful, ephemeral space newly inviolate, the space between the elements, the soldiers, the cavalrymen, the Red Cross medic, might be expected to open up like the mouth of the whale and to swallow each of them, all of it, the camera's gaze and the camera itself, swallow them back into the motionless, visionless void out of which everything had emerged. but his movement to the periphery was nothing but a feint, a taunt. And he returns with a nimble shimmy to his left, still clutching his fork, his bread, his plate, his tin cup.
Just before the 50 feet of film runs out, he raises his right hand again. He is greeting the camera and summoning its gaze to him. He does not know that in raising his right hand, the one with the fork and the hunk of bread, he is also gesturing farewell. He does not know it, this man without a name. But this is the end. <laughs>